All right, Doc, we're about to roll. This is Big Chris from Ellenwood, Georgia. Welcome everybody back to Manhood Mindset. We got a really, really special show for y'all this evening. Uh, hopefully, a lot of people get some help out of it, man. So what we're gonna, what we're gonna do is uh, allow our guests to. Um, well, we're gonna introduce our guests, but we're gonna ask our guests to go in depth of who he is. Some of y'all have uh, heard about him before. Some of y'all have seen him. Some of y'all have actually uh, met him. Uh, I want everybody to uh, to welcome Dr. Umar Johnson to Manhood Mindset. Dr. Johnson, how are you? Peace and love, family. Thanks for having me on the show. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much for coming back on. Uh, Doc, we got a lot of things that we want to talk about this evening. First of all, we want to kind of let you know about uh, what we do here at Manhood Mindset. Uh, what Manhood Mindset is, is the... Uh, national initiative from Omega Psi Phi Returning Incorporated. It's called Brother, You're On My Mind. And what we're trying to do is talk about specific events and specific instances that affect the mindset of African American males. Now, what we try to do with this show is try to help as many people as humanly possible. They don't have to be an African American male, but what we want to do is be intentional about the demographic that we're trying to help. And we want to applaud you for the work that you've done. And we want to kind of go a little bit more in depth uh, for the people who may not be familiar with who you are. We want to try to see if they can understand you and how they can get in contact with you as well. So can you tell the people a little bit more about yourself, please? Uh, certainly. I'm a doctor of clinical psychology, certified psychologist and principal. I work primarily in Pennsylvania these days evaluating children with special education eligibility. Um, I'm also a consultant to school districts, charter school superintendents, principals, parents, and educators across the world. I'm a Pan-Africanist, okay. former Minister of Education for Marcus Garvey's Universal Micro Improvement Association and African Communities League, which is the largest black history in modern, excuse me, the largest black organization in modern history. And it actually happens to be the movement that gave us the red, black, and green flag. Blood relative of the great Frederick Douglass, founder of the National Independent Black Parent Association, as well as the International Movement for the Independence and Protection of African People, currently on a crusade and a campaign to raise funds and build the first residential academy for black boys in the Western Hemisphere based off the principle of international economics and revolutionary pan-Africanism. Okay. And I'm also the author of Psychoacademic Holocaust, Special Education and ADHD Wars Against Black Boys. Yes, sir. And thank you for telling us about all the work that you have done and all the work that you plan on doing. Uh, what we want to do is go a little bit more in depth about some of the work that you are doing and how people can actually get involved and support. So we want you to be able to actually educate the people on how they can support throughout the interview uh, because I know we have you for quite a while but I know you have another engagement to get to so we want to get directly to the point. All right, is that cool with you, Doc? Yes, sir. All righty, so why do you do what you do? I became a school psychologist somewhat by accident okay. in the third grade while I was living in Jacksonville, North Carolina with my parents. I had decided that I wanted to become a clinical psychologist because I wanted to help children feel better about themselves. School psychology was an unexpected uh, term professionally, um, and that basically occurred because my undergraduate institution in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, Millersville University, mm -hmm. they actually offered a school psychology master's program. Okay. And so. You know, it kind of piqued my interest a little bit after I wasn't able to continue with the clinical master's program in Philadelphia because it was with famous. So I had decided to return back to Millersville University to pursue my graduate studies in the school psychology program. Okay. I had never heard of a school psychologist before. I had always done quite well in school, so there was no need to send school psychologists are largely the prerogative of children with learning disabilities. 
And so once I came back to Philadelphia, did my internship, mm -hmm. uh, certification as a school psychologist, that's when I came face to face with two of the greatest weapons of mass destruction that are put in the pathway of black boys, and that is special education and ADHD. And so now when we look at your book, when people say psychoacademic holocaust, um, and just by looking at your book, why did you choose those words? Yes, indeed. And when the book first uh, was published, that was a question that I got a lot mm -hmm. from journalists and interviewers. Why did you call it a holocaust? Right. Was that a bit excessive, extreme, unnecessary? No, it was appropriate. What is a holocaust? A holocaust is a one-sided genocide. A holocaust is an extermination campaign. Okay. And that is exactly what is being done to black men in America, and that is exactly what is being done to black boys in these United States. Holocaust is appropriate because when a black boy is improperly educated, mm -hmm. and then when he's subsequently economically castrated, that right there solidifies the foundation upon which wholesale genocide can take place. In fact, if it was up to me, every time a black male commits a crime, every time a black male is murdered, the school district that was responsible for educating him should be listed as an accomplice to the crime because there's few crimes committed by black men in America okay. that are not related to economic devastation, that are not related to miseducation. We know if a black boy can't read by the time he finishes the fifth grade, there's an 85% chance that he'll be spending some of his adulthood in prison. So a poorly educated black boy is an is a prisoner waiting to be incarcerated. So I believe Holocaust is, is a perfect description of what is taking place in America's schools. It is literally a Holocaust. And if it occurs against any other childhood population on this planet, it will be considered an act of genocide. American public education is not only a Holocaust, it is an act of genocide. It is one of the greatest human rights abuses taking place in the 21st century. Okay. Now, what a lot of people may not understand, we've heard of that phrase, uh, school to prison pipeline, right? And a lot of people may, you know, I know a lot of people may uh, uh, repeat that phrase. However, they don't necessarily know the details between how can a school directly pipeline human beings into the prison system. So can you elaborate on that whole notion? Uh, certainly. First, we need to understand that incarceration and education are both controlled by the state. Okay. Incarceration and education are directly controlled by the state. So be that as it may, there is a inverse relationship between education and incarceration. The better educated and prepared someone is to participate in society, the less likely they are to become an enemy. And when we look at incarceration versus education spending in the United States, particularly in school districts where African American children predominate, we see over the last 40 years a consistent increase in the amount of funds spent on education and a consistent decrease in the, uh, excuse me, a, a consistent increase in the amount of funds that are incarceration and a consistent decrease in the amount of funds that are spent on education. Okay. And another thing, people need to be very clear that the purpose of education was always to be important. Public education was created because capitalism put pressure on the government to, pro to provide them with a better educated low wage earner. Okay. It was the corporations and factories of America that said, listen, if you want to keep our businesses in the country, then provide us with a better educated low wage earner. Provide us with people who can at least read, count, and write. So from its inception, America and American education existed to provide the factories with efficient labor. Right. Minimally basic skills trained laborers. Well, at towards the end of the twentieth century and definitely now in the twenty first century, especially following uh, Bill Clinton's NAFTA in President Barack Obama's Trans-Pacific Partnership, even more corporations and jobs are being shipped out of America and sent to second and third world countries. So you're seeing the intensification of unemployment in this country. And with that intensification of unemployment, a widening of the gap between the have and the have not. Mm -hmm. So we have to really see incarceration as a function 
of, eco of a lack of economic opportunity and a lack of educational participation. In criminology, they study what gives rise to crime. And one of the basic explanations for the rise in crime is a drop in economic opportunity, period. When jobs are plentiful, crime goes down. When jobs are scarce, crime goes up. Why? Because people have to break the law in order to feed their families because the society in which they live has not provided adequate opportunity for everyone. Mm -hmm. When we talk about the school to prison pipeline, that's exactly what it is. In fact, I was told by a judge in New Jersey, I was told by a judge in New Jersey a couple of years ago that she sees more children in her courtroom because of school offenses mm. than she sees children in her courtroom because of street offenses. Okay. And I've even heard this from educational lawyers that the school increasingly in most states in this country, it is the school that is the primary provider of new criminals to the injustice system of America. Not the gangs, not drug dealing, not gun carrying, not stealing cars or hustling credit cards or strong armed robbery, but it is the school and the school police that are increasingly becoming the leading cause of juvenile incarceration and ultimately adult incarceration of black boys. So literally, they are going from the school to the prison, and part of that stems from the fact that with the so-called zero tolerance, get tough policies in America's public schools, which ironically was birthed because of white student crime, Columbine and all of these other white student massacres where white students came in and shot up white students, ironically, laws were created that were allowed, that were used to justify the excessive suspensions and expulsion in juvenile detainment of black children who were not guilty of mass shootings in America's public schools. Columbine, more than anything else, gave rise to the zero tolerance culture in America's public schools. But Columbine did not happen in Brooklyn. Columbine did not happen in Detroit. Mm -hmm. Columbine did not happen in Chicago. Black children do not have a history of coming into the school and shooting okay, defenseless students who had nothing to do with any type of situation that may have arisen against them. That was a white massacre. But white massacres have been used to intensify the, in criminal, the, the criminalization of black males. And the last thing I would say is in my work, I haven't done this for almost 20 years officially, mm -hmm. and more than 20 years unofficially, I would say that I have discovered six steps that America has created to basically see to it that every black male child in America becomes a casualty of the psychoacademic holocaust, the mass incarceration system, premature extermination. The first stage is miseducation. Mm -hmm. And it's important that your listeners understand that that miseducation is deliberate. It is not an accident. It is not a byproduct of poverty. Mm -hmm. It is not a byproduct of underpaid teachers. It is not a byproduct of incarcerated fathers. It is not a byproduct of unmarried uh, mothers. It is not a byproduct of listening to too much gangster rap. The schools deliberately undereducate black males. And why? The most revolutionary thing you could do in America is properly educate a black male. Exactly. When you properly educate a black male, you see to it that the last becomes first and the first becomes last. Hmm. A properly educated black male is now in a position to rival the white male for economic political domination of America. This is a system based on racism and it is maintained by racism under a so-called facade of colorblindism and the illusion of inclusion. So a, a properly educated black boy is an enemy of the state. A properly educated black boy is an enemy of the state. And as such, they must they must see to it that a black boy is never properly is never properly educated. Then we go to stage two special education, the deliberate and unnecessary evaluating and placing of black children with so-called learning disabilities in these special ed classes where they are destined to fall even further behind and ultimately will not be able to pass the graduation examination that more than half of America states now require of graduating 12th grade senior. And then we move into psychiatric medication. This is when they start diagnosing our kids with ADHD, conduct disorder, mm -hmm. opposition of defiance disorder, intermittent explosive disorder, disruptive behavior disorder, and they subsequently prescribe Ritalin, Adderall, Concerta, Meditate, Vivant, 
Richard Dawn Crow, that Gus is so packed up the list that goes on, and that's the psychiatric patient, juvenile incarceration. They have to kick the boys out, send them to discipline, send them to the juvenile detention center. They come out of the detention center and say, stage five, psychological frustration. This is when the boys get arrested. He would run them up, he would try to strike. He knows that something unfairly was done to him that saw to it that he was criminalized even before he's ever been arrested. And then that takes us to the final stage, stage six, which is premature extermination, normally at the hands of another black male. One out of every four black males will be murdered at the hands of another black boy, largely suffering the same debilitating effects of the psychoacademic Holocaust, i.e. the six stages of death. Wow. Wow. Um, <clears throat> one thing that stuck out to me is when you talked about the um, the entire process of making sure young black males at least get exposed, if not properly transferred to the prison system. Uh, one thing that I think of is the excessive discipline or the discord of, I guess, uh, unruly or undisciplined children. Uh, I know you've seen... Um, small students get written up on specific occasions uh, by just doing certain things that other kids are doing. Now, I understand that we may have students who have uh, exp extreme cases, right, when you become a harm to yourself or other students. However, have you seen and can you elaborate on the discipline system as far as write-ups for young black boys in the school system? The United States Department of Education released a landmark report approximately two years ago when they looked at the discipline of black, excuse me, the discipline of, of children, period, in America. Student disciplinary practices across the United States of America. And they found that black boys, and we were not surprised, just as in the criminal injustice system, it's the same thing in the miseducation system, the same racial disparities persist. They found that black boys were suspended and expelled at three, four, five, six, seven times the rate of white boys for the exact same offenses. And even more shockingly, the information also suggested that black boys in kindergarten and preschool were being suspended and expelled more than white boys in high school. Mm. In fact, the greatest rise in suspension and expulsion was for preschool and kindergarten. So the question that black America and all of America needs to ask itself, and of course most of America is less, because the people who will enslave you have no problems miseducating you. The people who will enslave you have no problems miseducating you. But the question that black America has to ask itself, what can a four, five, or six-year-old do? What can a four, five, or six-year-old do to be permanently barred from receiving any education? And to help explain this reality, we need to look no further than the racism of America's predominant white female public charter parochial independent and private school teaching corps. 97% of all teachers are women, and 93% of the 97% are white racist females. So when you're looking at suspension, when you're looking at expulsion, when you're looking at uh, retention, when you're looking at any type of index of academic maladjustment or failure to succeed, we have to realize that the conduit for all of this is the white female teacher. The classroom don't teach, the books don't teach, the curriculum don't teach, the lesson plans don't teach, the building don't teach, the principal don't teach. It is the teachers that teach. So it is the teachers that make the disciplinary referral. It's the teacher that recommended child that be suspended. It's the teacher that, you know, ultimately in concert with the principal will recommend that a child is uh, referred for expulsion by the local public school board. So the white women is often left off the hook. She is often basically ignored in this whole process. She's treated like she's a victim when the truth of the matter is she is the victim perpetrator of the school to prison pipeline. And if you want to reverse this, all we have to do is give black men strong black men teachers. Strong black male teachers is the solution, but it will never happen. And why? America, America's public education system is a white female dominated institution. In fact, it is probably the only 
institution along with nursing and social work that is predominantly female. And as a result of that, because it is dominated by white women, they are not about to eliminate the, the numerical dominance that white women have in that profession by hiring black males because that's not what that's not what's in the best interest of white teachers. They don't want black men in the schools because black men are not going to stand by and watch their son be disrespected by white folks. They're not going to stand by and let that happen. So the best way to deal with that is to prevent black men from coming into the schools. Go to almost any school. How often do you see a black male? How many of us have black male teachers? How many boys in America have ever had a black male teacher? And they will come up with all kinds of excuses for why that is. They'll say, well, black men don't want to teach. Teaching is considered feminine, yada, yada, yada. It's a bunch of nonsense. And I'm going to tell you why. These programs in America, emergency teacher certification programs in America, where they give a lot of white men, white males, who do not have any concern whatsoever with black children, and white men are all in this across America teaching black children makes emergency teacher certification. They do not have a degree in education. They do not have a license. But they are in there under emergency certification so they can do what? Pay their bills. Black kids should be the same thing for black men. We have over 2 million African Americans in this country with master's and doctorate degrees who cannot find work. Why not get some of these unemployed black men who do not have a prison record to come into the schools and work with our boys. Are you trying to tell black people that white men care about black kids more than black men? That's an absolute lie. The reason we don't have more black men in the schools is because they're not interested in bringing them into the schools. Hmm. Okay. Now, one thing that you did mention earlier was the special education aspect of everything that's going on. Um, can you elaborate on... Uh, I, I know I mentioned, uh, well, I, I've actually heard you say before, and correct me if I'm wrong, that if a neurological disorder is, I would say, uh, claimed on a student, don't you need a neurological test, right? So how can someone determine a neurological disorder without a neurological test? Uh, good, good point. I would say that if you want to scientifically verify the presence of a presumed learning disability, then you would need to have a neurological assessment. Okay. But neurological evaluations are not required. Okay. They are not required by law for the evaluation of children for special education disability and service. They're not required. Okay. Very few children receive them. And even with neurological assessments, you still have to be careful because even with those, you know, they're not totally scientific. At the end of the day, the conclusion is made by the evaluating psychologist. And that is one thing that parents need to be very clear about, black parents in particular, that when the psychologist makes a determination, the psychologist makes a determination based on my own professional experience, expertise, bias, and training as it relates to the numerical data that the test gets inform us with. It is based on the qualitative data that we get from interviewing the parent, we get from interviewing the teacher, we get from reviewing the child's record. We have all this data and these must make a determination. The tests don't make that determination. There is no test that diagnoses anything in anybody. Hmm. There is no test that diagnoses anything in anybody. We do the diagnosis. We do the diagnosis. Hmm. And it's important that parents understand that it is human beings, not tests, it is the human being that ultimately says your child has a reading disability, a math disability, ADHD. It is a professional opinion, and it is nothing more than that. So when, when someone says my child has a reading disability, they're not saying a fact. They're not stating a fact. All they are stating is the fact of someone's opinion. Hmm. That's all that means. Psychologist says my daughter has a math disability. That's the psychologist's opinion. Mm -hmm. They can't prove it. They can argue it, but they can't prove it. It's sort of like going to court. You have to what? Prove beyond a reasonable doubt. You don't have to prove that they did it. You have to prove that the, you have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. So it can still be a doubt, but you just have to prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt. Right. There is no uh there is no what's the word for it? There is no a way to totally rule out the fact 
or Will Lynn, you know, did he commit the murder? You know, did O.J. did it? We'll never know if O.J. did it. Mm -hmm. the, the court case wasn't even about O.J. doing it. The court case was about whether or not the prosecution could prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he likely committed the murder. You because could be no full way to know. of schooling in our country and across and all over the world actually and we're talking about just the mental capabilities and the mental I guess destruction that people may go through in those four walls of our educational system and we've already talked about uh, the school to prison pipeline we've already talked about the ADHD wars uh, we have already talked about uh, several instances that people just need to look out for now Dr. Umar I want to I want you to elaborate on when people hear all of these situations that you mentioned earlier. I know, I know you probably have, and correct me if I'm wrong, witnessed the helpless uh, mentality or the helpless attitude from not only students but also the parents and other stakeholders in the community. So what are some things that people can do when they hear all of these things that, are, that may be stacked up against them? What are some things that they must understand before they try to find out a solution? Well, I would say the greatest problem that we have right now in uh, on, on our side, on the community side of the equation, stepping away from the racism uh, momentarily, is that we have a culture, a crisis of indifference. We have a crisis of indifference among black children. They are so turned off and disinterested in their education that I would argue that more often than not, the test scores and grades that our children get are not reflective of their skill level at all. Okay, it is reflective of their interest. For the, for the average black child, a C does not mean I can only do C work. Mm -hmm. A C means I only care to do C work. You know, if a child scores below basic on the standardized assessment, that below basic score does not indicate that the kid is below basic. It indicates that that was all he was interested in putting out. I mean, I'm telling you, we have a culture of learned helplessness in the schools. We have a culture of I could care less, and I'm going to blame the black community as well as the black family for this because we do not value education as a community. I mean, let's think about it. We do not, we do not encourage, we do not celebrate high achieving students. All we care about is athletes. I mean, we just have to be honest. The black community only cares about athletics and entertainment. A child is failing every subject in school. Every subject in school, he can be failing. But guess what? If he's the best basketball player, he will be champion. He will be celebrated. He will be honored. Meanwhile, he might have a kid in that school that straight A's and B's, National Honor Society, one in the top percentile of all children in America, and you might not even know who that kid is. And we see this regularly across black America. So we are sending our children a very dangerous message that basically says academics are irrelevant. Talent is the only thing that matters. Hmm. So when we get into a situation where the parents play a major role and the miseducation or just the um, the lack of support of our youth. Um, are you saying that we have to start asking ourselves the tough questions of how are we supporting the system that's basically, you know, disarming our young boys and girls? Well, the question is the same as it relates to racism in general in America. And that is to say that although racism is the primary cause of black America's issues, we are in fact its number one accomplice. Mm. We do more than anyone else or anything else other than systematic racism to disenfranchise and imbalance the opportunities that we have. And it's the same thing in public education. Mm -hmm. You know, apart from systemic racism in education, 
the greatest supporter and collaborator with that system is the black community itself. I mean, homework is an endangered species in the black community. Mm-hmm. You know, you walk into a school and do a survey, how many kids do homework every night? And you'd be surprised if you get more than, you know, 10% of the kids in that school, there's no homework, there's no reading, you know, very few black homes have a bookshelf, very few black homes have a dictionary, very few black homes have an encyclopedia or a thesaurus. You know, um, it's, 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 it's a shame. It is absolutely horrendous um, how we are encouraging the school to prison pipeline. I mean, even without Christmas shopping, I always thought, you know, the parents, you know, I'm doing my lectures, like I was in Mount Vernon, New York the other day, and I, and, I, and I spoke to the parents about how, you know, the gifts you buy your child are setting them up for future incarceration because you're investing in things that take them away from academic improvement. Mm-hmm. You're investing in cell phones, video games, laptops, HD TVs. I mean, I don't have to tell you that black children watch more TV than any other child in America. Mm-hmm. I don't have to tell you that black children spend more time on their cell phones than any other child in America. I don't have to tell you that black children spend more time surfing the internet and playing video games than all the other children in America combined as a percentage. So why are you investing in devices and activities that are going to take your child away from academic practice and enrichment? Mm-hmm. You know, time that we spent years ago when we were growing up, time that we spent years ago reading is now spent video games. Time that was spent doing homework is now spent surfing the internet. Time that was spent, you know, studying for the test is now being spent on the tablet. So black America, i.e. our parents, are literally wasting millions of dollars, billions even, distracting their children from improving their education. So we are literally financing their future incarceration. Dr. Umar, as a child in this whole system, when I go to school, um, and see all of the barriers that you mentioned earlier. Then I come home and see more distractions and more barriers for the kids that may be listening to this podcast or this radio show right now or who could be listening in the future. A child, and I get all of this from all different areas, from school and at home. What are my options? Three things. Three things I always tell children that they have to focus on as children in order to lay that pathway for future success. Number one, you have to develop the discipline. You have to develop Mm self-control to do what you need to do when you don't want to do it. One thing about all great achievers, all great inventors, all great leaders, all great people throughout history, you know, Africans and non-Africans, the racists and the non-racists, all great people have one thing in common, and that is they were able to sacrifice they were able to sacrifice the things they wanted to do mm-hmm. so that they could achieve the thing that they desired to do. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to give up in order to go up. The better person you want to become, then the less free time you're going to have. The better person you want to become, the less time you're going to have hanging out with your friends. There is a price to be paid for success. And children need to start paying that, paying that price early. Mm-hmm. Uh, number two, commit to being the best. You know, as I said, we have that crisis of indifference. We have a crisis of complacency. Mm -hmm. Too many black children are simply content with being average. That is a big problem, okay? Just this whole thing about being average. I don't mind just being another, you know, uh, 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 Joe Schmo. And because of that, a lot of our children will end up unemployed because they're not the best of the best. You have to be the best of the best. There is no place for second place in America. Uh, for anybody, and especially mm-hmm. not for black folks. As mm-hmm. Michael Mack said, you've got to be twice as good to get half as much. And then the third thing, they need to read more. Our children do not read. Mm-hmm. The average working vocabulary level of a black child in America is two grades beneath their current class standing. So if you're a senior, you're working vocab, the words you use in conversation and the words you can understand in print are only on temporary level. And for a lot of kids, it's worse than that. Mm-hmm. Some children have a working vocabulary level that's four and five grades beneath their standing. Imagine a tenth grader whose working vocabulary level is on the fifth grade. Mm-hmm. Why? Because he don't read. And this is why I tell parents, you've got to put books in front of these children. Take away the video games, take away the tablets, take away um, the laptops and, 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 and everything else, the cell phone, and put books in front of them. Mm-hmm. Because when you read, you know, there's four things that happen. You improve your working vocabulary. 
You improve your general knowledge of facts and information. You improve your ability to communicate in conversation. And you improve your ability to communicate in print. Mm -hmm. Four things that are absolutely necessary in order for you to do well on any examination, whether it's the state exam or whether it's the college interest examination. So just by reading, mm -hmm. our children can improve their abilities to do better. One of the reasons a lot of black parents believe that their children get a better education was in white schools is because they're really getting a better education. Mm -hmm. In many cases, they're not. But you know what happens from a school to a suburban school? The level of vocabulary, the quality of conversation, the quality of language that is used by the teachers, by our classmates, by the community in which the school exists, it improves. And because your working vocabulary has improved, your test scores go up. It doesn't mean you're getting a better education, but you're exposed to a, a higher quality mm -hmm. of conversation and language, mm -hmm. and that translates into those scores. Wow, so discipline, commitment, and reading. So if we have a young person out there that may be underage, under the age of 18, let's say, for instance, if they're between the ages of 8 and 15, and they're going to school every day, going through some of the barriers that you mentioned, and when they come home, mom's not there, dad's not there, uh, siblings may not be taking it, uh, taking education kind of seriously, but they want to do better. So their discipline, their commitment, and their reading habits could help progress them through all of these distractions. Is that, did I hear you correctly? What's our question? Okay. And see, we got to realize something. Reading is a very good disciplinary exercise. Okay. When you read, you can't watch TV, hmm. cell phone, video games, True. entertain phone calls. True. Reading requires focus. Reading requires focus. And although some people can read with the background music, okay, I can tolerate that. Mm -hmm. But reading requires focus. It is a disciplinary activity. And one of the reasons our children don't read more is because they don't have the self-control to make themselves sit down, stay still, and focus on the material. So mm -hmm. good readers are often people who also have some degree. They may not be perfect at it, but people who read on the regular, who have that ability to force themselves to focus, on that to the exclusion of other things, they tend to end up having, mm -hmm. you know, a respectable level of, 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 of self-discipline and control. Okay. Dr. Umar, if you don't mind, I know we talked about some of the things that the parents can do, um, but I do know, and I'm pretty sure that you might have seen this as well, several people in the community that want to volunteer and help, but they may not be the parent of some of these children that are in the schools. So can you educate the volunteer on their options to help with going on? Uh, yes. In fact, um, there's a volunteer effort that I would certainly welcome any of your listeners to participate in, and that would be with the National Independent Black Parent Association. The National Independent Black Parent Association is an organization we started almost a year ago in May of 2016 mm -hmm. to organize black parents at every school district in America okay. so that they could fight against racism, bias, and disproportionality in America's school in the seven key areas of special education, discipline, finance, policy, social support, homeschooling, and parent advocacy. Again, special education, discipline, policy, finance, social support, homeschooling, and parent advocacy. And if any of your listeners would like to join a chapter mm -hmm. of the National Independent Black Parent Association, or if they are interested in starting a chapter of the National Independent Black Parent Association, they can get in contact with me uh, by email at drumarjohnson.com. Um, also, drumarjohnson at Yahoo. Dot com, D R U M A R Johnson dot com, or D R U M A R Johnson at Yahoo dot com, mm -hmm. and also by phone at 844 D R U M A R, and in fact, in about two weeks, mm -hmm. I'm going to be hosting a whole conference orientation mm -hmm. by phone for brothers and sisters who are interested in starting a National Independent Black Parent Association study group. Mm. In order to start a chapter, you must attend one of our regional training conferences. There are three of them 
held every year. The next one will be in May, and it will likely be in the Midwest in May. Mm -hmm. And so they would need to attend that before they can be president of a chapter. But until they attend that conference, they are welcome to start a black parent step group where they live, where they basically bring black parents together, talk to them about their issues, mm -hmm. uh, have conversations and discussions about what needs to be done. They don't officially take up things that need to happen once they become a chapter. Mm -hmm. But if anyone is interested in starting a chapter, excuse me, a study group of the National Independent Black Home Association, you can definitely get in contact with me soon so they can be a part of that teleconference orientation in the next two weeks. We are trying to build the first national movement by black parents uh, to change education in this country. We've had a national civil rights movement. We've had other types of national movements, black labor, but we've never had black parents. We've never had black parents organized, and so we're trying to do that at this point. Okay, thanks, Doc. Um, what we want to do right now is, uh, I know you mentioned reading and you were talking about some of the things that we can come together and have that study group, right? Can you have, can you give us some suggestions of books that people can just start reading on their own and kind of familiar with some of the things that you've seen and some of the things that you know good and well that we need to know moving forward if we're going to be effective in this fight? In addition to my book, Psycho-Academic Holocaust, Special Education and ADHD Wars Against Black Boys. In addition to my book, and I do want to caution your, your listeners, do not purchase my book online. Uh, oh. Someone is bootlegging my book. They're selling oh. fraudulent copies on Amazon. We're currently trying to track them down. So please do not purchase my book on Amazon. It's a form. Okay. Um, contact me directly through the, through the website, and um, they will be able to order the book directly from me. Okay. So that is um, that's the first thing. So um, do not go on Amazon. Do not go on Amazon, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, do not go do on not. Amazon. My book is self-published. Okay. The only way to get it is to get it from me. If you get it from anybody else, it's plagiarized. Oh wow! Oh wow! Okay. Continue, please. Sir. Yeah. And uh, when I was in uh, where was I at uh, before Chicago? I forget where I was, but like two. Days, two, three days ago, a brother came up with a fake copy, bought the book online, he didn't know no better. Mm -hmm. And um, I told him that it was plagiarized and I gave him a free copy. Wow. Because, you know, he had a, a fake book. It's thinner, it's darker, mm -hmm. pages are thinner. You can tell the difference if you've ever seen an original. Yeah. But, um, so, they need to read my book. Okay. The other thing they need to read, too, is not a book, and that is they need to read the student code of conduct for the school district. Mm. They need to read the parent demand book. These are things that black parents need to have a copy of and need to read. The average black parent has never read the code of conduct mm. for their child's school. The average black parent, rich or poor, rich or poor, right. has not read the parent handbook. How could you not read the parent handbook? How could you not read the code of conduct? Something else that they need to read, they need to read the teacher's contract with the school district. They need to read the teacher's contract school district. Every parent should read the teacher's contract with the school district so they can see exactly what teachers are allowed to do and what teachers are not allowed to do. Get a copy of the union contract. The union contract with your child's school district. Read that. They also need to, if they think their child needs special ed or if the child is in special ed, they need to download um, their school district special education policy. They need to read the school district special ed policy. They need to read the state special ed code. Okay, so mm -hmm. a lot of the parents need to read is not a book. A lot of it is free. It mm -hmm. is downloadable. It is on the school district's website. Mm -hmm. It is on the state department of education's website. And it is on the state school board's website. That's what they need to be reading. Mm -hmm. Most parents are totally ignorant about school law and school policy because they do not read about it. And that's what we need to start with. Hmm. The only book that they need to read right now is mine. Most of what they need that will be important for them to protect their kids is the policies and the state statutes as it relates to education. So if you're listening right there um, live, ladies and gentlemen, even if you're a student um, in your specific county, you need to go to the Board of Education website and read every single policy you can get your hand on and the contracts of the teachers. Is that correct? Uh, without question. And for those listeners who have 
will be reaching out to me hopefully soon mm -hmm. uh, to start a study group and ultimately become a chapter of the National Independent Black Parent Association. One of our models is we investigate, educate, we advocate. We investigate, we educate, we advocate. Okay. That is our motto. So education is the first step of the National Independent Black Parent. We investigate. We get the information. That means we read the policy. We go to the school board meetings. That's another big problem. Black parents do not attend school board meetings. If, if you want to find the widest meeting in the black community, the widest meeting in the black community is the school board meeting. That is the widest meeting in the black community. You want to go twist with a number of black folks, a number of white folks, and a black folks, go to the school board meetings. Black parents are not there. White folks are there. Why? Because they get grants. They're getting the contracts, mm -hmm. they're taking out the charter school application. White folks are always there, getting your money and getting your service, but we're not there. So, presidents of the National Independent Black Parent Association are required to attend every monthly school board meeting. How can we make a difference if we don't even know what's going on? That's correct. Um, and the um the flow chart or the um, the um, infrastructure of your Black Parent Association, they can look, they can reference that online. How you want it structured and how it's supposed to be ran. No, nah, what will happen? They will only get that from me through email. So once they do the email, if they're interested in starting a study group, I'm going to send something back to them, okay. um, which will basically be a simple summary of what study groups can do and what they cannot do. Gotcha. And then they will participate on the orientation, and then they can go ahead and start operating this study group until they attend um, the um, next training conference. And we have to, we have a year. We have a year to convert from a study group to a chapter. If you cannot attend a training conference within 12 months' time from the start of the study group, will be frozen. It will be discontinued mm -hmm. until we find someone else more motivated to turn it into a chapter. Okay, that's, that's understood. And uh, will you repeat how people can get in contact with you and what they must do in order to be introduced and how to start a chapter? Uh, if they're interested in starting a study group, which mm -hmm. is a prelude to Pre the chapter, mm -hmm. then they can email me. Umar Johnson at Johnson.com. That's R U M A R Johnson at Yahoo.com. They can also email me on Skype. Johnson Umar Johnson.com. Okay. Um, they can also call 844 4 D R U M A R. Again, 844 4 D R U M A R. And I also want your listeners to know. That every Tuesday morning I host a free phone teleconference. Yes, what, okay. Every Tuesday morning, if parents have any questions about their children in the areas of education and mental health, they can call 857 232 and the access code is 870 Account. Again, that is every week, 6 a.m. until 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay. Eastern Standard Time. And with that, they can get all the free answers they want. If they want a private consultation, okay. if any of your parents listening to this broadcast, if they want a private consultation, okay. they can email me and they can request a private consultation. It costs $50. And they can send me their child's paperwork and we will set up a time on the telephone where I can go over everything with them and give them some station on what they need to do next. So you got public consultation for free, okay. private consultation for cheap, and then they need to read my book and then they need to become a part of the National Independent Black Parent Association. But let me also make them aware of uh, the second annual Black College and Consciousness Tour, okay. which I want to be working on the next week or two to finalize that registration should be ready in the next couple of weeks. Uh, 11 to 17-year-old Black boys and girls, the 
14 day, 14 night overnight camp, a boot camp, okay. a black power boot camp. Uh, we'll be going from Atlanta this year and we will be visiting Morehouse, Bowman, South Carolina State, Tennessee State, Sis, Lamar, Owen College, uh, and the list goes on. The Oyotunji African Village, the National Civil Rights Museum, the Selma uh, African History Museum, the Montgomery Folk Institute, the Charleston, South Carolina Civil War Trail, the Dr. King Center. Last year, we did Lincoln, Cheney, Hampton, Norfolk State, uh, University of Maryland, Eastern Shore, Delaware State, Howard, Coppin. We did the Nat Turner Trail. Harry coming home fresh up with our Benjamin Banner on Nat Turner Trail. Mm -hmm. uh, we did the Underground Railroad, the Great Black Swag Museum, the African Holocaust Museum. It's, it's my, my college story is different from a lot of others because we just don't take them to college. Mm -hmm. We also raise their consciousness by exposing them to information and significant landmarks in the black struggle in America so they get the best of both worlds, they get the college and the consciousness. Okay. This year, the dates of the tour will be uh, what is it? June 28th to July the 12th, I believe it is. Mm -hmm. June 28th to July the 12th. 14 days, 14 nights, boys and girls co-ed, two to a room, we stay in nice hotels, we take them to great adventures, Dorney Park, we play paintball, pizza parties, pool parties, they have a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. Uh, no child. I didn't have a single kid, even the 11 year old. I didn't have a single kid mm -hmm. that I'm ready to go home. They wanted to stay even longer after the two weeks. So, okay. if you got parents out there who are interested, again, they can use the email or the phone number to get in contact with me about that as well. Doc, how much longer? I know you have a, uh, another engagement to go to. How many minutes do we you think you have? Uh, it is, uh, we can go until uh, 8.30. 8.30, cool. All right. All right, we have a couple of uh, questions for you. Um, sure. I know some people, we uh, especially talking about all the issues in the black community, first of all, I would like to get your specific definition because we, we throw that word around black community, right? And I'm not sure if everybody understands exactly what that means. So if you don't mind, just elaborate on your definition of what the black community is. And after that, I want you to, if you don't mind, elaborate on the relationship between the youth and the elders and the perceived distrust that may, some people may feel. So your, your, right. defi your definition of black community first, and then the elder youth relationship. Well, as far as community go, when we refer to a black community, it's important that people understand that we really don't have a black community mm. because community is a compound word it means right. common unity it means a group of people who right. are organized okay. and working together towards a collective shared agenda we don't have that okay so when we say community we're largely talking about wow. black people in america <laughs> that's what we're really talking wow. about there is no common agenda there is no common platform <laughs> and we're definitely not organized in order to have a community you must be organized. Chinese have a community. Arabs have a community. Okay, East Indians have a community. European Jews have a community. They are organized. They have a shared agenda. Mm. They meet as a community, not just the leaders, but the people. The people. They meet as a community. They determine what the agenda is. They decide who can come into the community, who can't. They control the shops. They control the politicians. They control the churches. We don't have a community. We have mm. neighborhoods residential districts and concentration camps. We don't have a community. We have neighborhoods, residential areas, and concentration camps. We still have to get to community. So we that's, have to get there. So when we use that word, we're saying it as a thing that we must strive to obtain. Exactly. Not that, we're oh, okay. it as a reality to be achieved. Ah, so, okay. So I want to make sure, because sometimes I use that term as well, the black community. So I want to make sure that I'm using it in its proper context based off of reality. You know what I mean? Because sometimes what we have is a collection of tribes. That's what we have. Okay. We <laughs> was ironic because okay. for us to not know exactly which ethnic nations from which we descend. That's true. Because that was stolen, you know, from us during slavery. Right. We are the most tribalistic Africans in the world without any uh without any conscious connection to their tribal history. I mean we got every Political and ideological <laughs> and difference that 
you can find with the election of black America is the election of uh, mm. celebrities, you know, sororities, it is true. Whether it's conscious organizations, whether it's the churches, we are a collection of tribes. That's all we are. So let me ask you this. Um, and I want, and I already know I asked you, asked you a question, but since you mentioned tribes, I had a, I had a really in-depth conversation with a friend of mine. Is that I think at our detriment as a people, if we're tribal, we're fighting against an entity that's colonial. Um, and that was the first time I've ever heard of that. What are your thoughts on us as being naturally tribal people, but we're fighting against uh, colonialism? So how does well, that roll? Here's the thing. We are naturally communalistic, or national community oriented. Okay. We are, we're a nature based people. Okay. You know, so we're about the community. Now, the tribalism isn't something I would say that is organic to African. The tribalism okay. is the petty differences ah, that we actually tend to keep different ethnic nation apart from each other. Okay. First of all, let's understand the word tribe in and of itself is a racist word. Really? The word tribe, and yes, the word tribe, if you know, they only use the word tribe when they talk about us. You never heard them call the Chinese tribe, the Korean tribe, you know, the Jews, the, the, the Italian tribe, mm -hmm. the Irish tribe, okay. the Greek tribe. They only use tribe when they talk about black because it is a connotation of some of equality, the connotation of dehumanization. Wow. Yes, tribe is a racist word. For the cause of people or nation, hmm. culture or group, that's what we would say. So not the Zulu tribe, the Zulu people. Not the Zulu tribe, the Zulu nation. Hmm. Not the Zulu tribe, the, the, the Zulu group, the Zulu culture. Wow. So the, the correct terminology would be nation. People. Because they were not tribes, they were ethnic nations. Okay. You see, so that's why we would say use the word nation, culture, okay, or people, as opposed to tribe, because tribe is a racist word that white people created to suggest the inhumanity of those of different groups of African people. Wow. So we did not call ourselves tribes. We were called tribes, and we were repeating the word. Exactly. We never used that word in ourselves. Pretty deep. That's pretty deep. Okay, next, I want to make sure that I get to these questions. And we have a parent that chimed in on uh, Facebook as well and wanted to get your take on some things. Uh, the second question I asked you was the relationship or the lack of relationship between the elders and the youth. Can you speak on some of the things that you've seen personally and what can we do to build a bridge to uh, close that gap? Yes, here's the issue. A lot of the old lion, young lion stuff, old lioness, young lioness, the Luke amongst the males and the females too. Mm -hmm. A lot of that relates to castrated ego situations. Wow. In America, black men are not allowed to be men. Okay. They're not allowed to be men. We're not allowed to express masculinity because it's considered threatening. Black masculinity is threatened. Okay. Which is one of the reasons why a feminizing posture is so popular because you can make it in corporate America if you are an effeminate male, i.e. Don Lemon. You can make it if you're an effeminate male. You cannot make it as a masculine man. You see very few masculine men in leadership positions in this country. I don't care if it's corporate America. I don't care if it is uh, within the school system, politics, the media. Masculine black males do not make it far in this society. Most masculine black males are in jail or they play sports. And that is it. Okay, so black masculinity is something that is quite feared in this country. You see, so when a black man is not allowed to be a man, you know, he's not allowed to express his masculinity through wealth. He's not allowed to express his masculinity through business ownership. He's not allowed to express his masculinity through capitalism. So we have been limited. The only way we're able to express our masculinity is by doing what? Through women, hmm. through sex and baby making women, and then also through dominating other oppressed black men, mm. dominating other oppressed black men. That's why black on black crime is so prevalent. Mm. Because when you're castrated, when you're psychologically castrated as a male, 
the only way you can do what? Realize your masculinity is by oppressing another male. Think about it. If you are powerful, you have no political economic power. Your life has no relevance in America. The black man's life has no relevance in this country. No, it is hated. That's all. If you want to realize, if you want to feel what power, you want to experience what power truly feels like. You want to experience true power. Do you know what you're going to have to do? Okay. The only way you're going to be able to experience true power is to dominate a woman. And not necessarily through race, but just through being able to win her over and be alone. That can give you a sense of masculinity. So, in your relationships with females, with the opposite sex, and then also in your relationship with oppressed black men through domination. Mm -hmm. To take a man's life, to take a man's life can give you a strong room of power. Mm -hmm. It is very negativistic. It is reactionary. It mm -hmm. is deplorable. It is unacceptable. It is inhumane. But guess what? It can fulfill your thirst for power. I mean, what greater manifestation of power than to be able to take the life of another person? Mm -hmm. See, that's why we go to such extremes when we talk about black and black crime. See, we're not just looking to beat up another black man. We're not just looking, you know, to uh, dominate another black man. We want to take his life. Mm -hmm. Why is it necessary to take his life? Because you need to demonstrate that you have power. Black on black crime on a basic level mm -hmm. can be interpreted as a black man's exaggerated and desperate attempt to to, to develop some degree of power by taking the life of another man. Well, it is the powerlessness. Right. Powerlessness is that the root of black and black fascism. Right. You see, so let's translate that to the black organization. Okay. You got a black man who leads. Remember, the only time a black man is allowed to lead is in the black community. You're not allowed to lead in America. You're not allowed to lead in the black government president. Weak as president, he wasn't even allowed to leave because he didn't do nothing. The white president could do it. He wasn't allowed to leave. So he was not a leader in any way, shape, or form. So when you become pastor of the church, when you become president of the Black Power Movement, guess what? For the first time, you experience true power. You experience what you've always wanted your whole life, and because you're not allowed to have it anywhere else, guess what you do? You become a dictator. It goes mm -hmm. to your head. You don't want to shoot under this parent because it feels so good to finally be in control of something because the white man gave you control of nothing and you end up going too fast. And that's why the average black church is a dictatorship. That is why the average black organization is a dictatorship. Mm. We do not share power. And so what happens, you've been a pastor for 50 years, another young brother comes along. Guess what? You don't allow him to lead. You don't allow him to do any sermons. You don't allow him to flex his young masculinity at all because you feel threatened by any other black man. You mm -hmm. feel threatened. You need absolute power because your thirst, your thirst has not been quenched and it can never be quenched because no matter how long you are the pastor, no matter how long you are the president, it will not be long enough to make up for all the time you can never be in society. And that is the root cause of why we do not pass down power in the black community. If you notice, we have the oldest leaders in America. We have the oldest leaders in America. We have pastors, 80 and 90 years old. Mm -hmm. Why didn't that pastor turn that over to a young pastor? He doesn't have to disappear. He can still be there. He can still be a pastor. Mm -hmm. Wait, you begin to share. Because you have to do what? Prepare the next generation. You have to prepare the next generation if you care about the community, not just your ego. Black mm -hmm. men don't do a good job of preparing the next generation. Mm -hmm. Because to start preparing the next generation is to do what? Accept your mortality. Accept your mortality. Mm -hmm. And the last thing the castrated male of the black man wants to do is accept its mortality. Doc, I'm, uh, let's just move on. Because uh, I got to process that. That was, that was a lot. I appreciate your honesty with that. Your blunt honesty with it uh, is going to help us grow. Um, in fact, when mm -hmm. I was in the UNIA, you know, to argue, I went through that. Okay. And in Philadelphia, I was the first vice president. I should have been the president of the chapter okay. of the division, as they call it, in the Garvey movement. Mm -hmm. But I was never allowed to run for president of it because my elders 
most of whom were old enough to be not my father, but my grandfather. Mm. They were so jealous and insecure of what I brought to the table that they tried to cut off my leadership potential in every way, shape, or form. Mm. And I've learned a lot from those men, most of whom are my own uncles now. They had Jamie Ancestry, rest in peace to all of them. I'm indebted to them okay. because I learned a lot about life. I learned a lot about leadership. I learned a lot about self-hate mm -hmm. from them. Mm -hmm. You know, so who I am now, a lot of that wisdom came directly from the elders of the Garvey movement in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. But although I learned a lot of good from them, they also showed me, you know, how castrated the black man's ego was. Wow. And for those who know my personal history, I had to leave the Philadelphia division of the UNIA in order to spread my wings. Right. And part of me becoming who I am now is the direct root of me stepping away from the table if you would. Had I never stepped away from that table, I would be where I am now because those elders were dead set on not letting White Johnson ever become a leader within that division. So I, I saw firsthand how the old castrated uh, male ego can function to oppress up and coming leadership. This is what I got from what you just said. Um, and the thing that stuck out to me is the gap between the elders and the youth stems from the need to be the man instead of a man. Exactly. Wow. HNIC syndrome. It is the HNIC syndrome. The biggest psychological issue amongst black men is the HNIC syndrome. Look, wow. take Brother Malcolm. Okay. Malcolm X was murdered because of the HNIC syndrome. Mm -hmm. Malcolm was killed because people wanted to prevent him from becoming the HNIC. Mm -hmm. That's how threatened black men are by other powerful black men. Wow. H and I C Central. You know, for example, I've been invited to different events mm -hmm. by quote unquote emerging black leaders if you would. And I don't know from all of, I gotta be there very effective watch why. Because mm -hmm. I have a very effective order. I'm probably the best allowed of my people right now. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of people I can do something mm -hmm. because I'm not interested in doing that. I'm interested in the work. I'm going to look at a situation and say, you know what? Mm -hmm. I can't take that invitation. Because okay. if I take that invitation, I'm going to become the magnet at that event. And I'm not interested in taking away from someone else a sense to, you know, be the HNIC. I'm not ah. interested in that. So okay. I have to judge things from that angle. I have to really look at my strength of character as an organizer and as a leader. And if it's stronger than the next brother, out of respect for him, okay. I have to let him. Uh, you know, be the king of his own castle because mm -hmm. that can engender jealousy and animosity. I have people come to me and say, hey, I want you to meet this leader. I want you to meet this person. I want you to work with this leader. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I have to say no. And they'll say, why? And I'll say, respectfully, in certain areas, I'm stronger than him. Mm -hmm. I'm much stronger than him in certain areas. And I know it's going to start jealousy because see, that H&IC thing, Chris, it breeds the jealousy. Mm -hmm. It breeds the animosity. Wow. It breeds the hate when a black male is upstaged by another black male, even if it is accidentally, mm. because you can't hide who you are. You cannot hide, you cannot contain charisma. You have to say a word when you have charisma. And people already, you know, and, and with me, our, people already know who I am. So if I walk to that room, I'm going to take that attention. And then you part to now hide it, and that can affect our relationship. But out of respect, for emerging leaders, I stay out of their domain of leadership if I feel that my energy is going to be stronger than I have to, because I know how dangerous the H and I C situation is among black males, and it can get you killed. Dr. Umar, we're going to close with this last question. We have a, a question from uh, Samia from Atlanta. Hey, you know what, brother Chris? I got a text from the parents just now. Oh, you got a dip? They're running late, so if you want to go until nine, we can go until nine. They're oh. running late, so. All righty, let's roll then. All right, now check this out. We have a young lady named Samia from Atlanta, and she wants to get your opinion on the homeschooling aspect of trying to combat everything that you mentioned earlier. You know, you have a lot of people who say, well, I'm going to just homeschool my child, right? However, you have a lot of people who may not understand the details behind homeschooling. Can you elaborate on that, please? Uh, certainly. Uh, homeschooling is a very good temporary alternative to the education system. I will not call it a solution. Okay. And that's because as a youngster, as a plan after a long story, true solutions have to be systematic. 
that means they have to finish the school, not just certain children. Mm -hmm. Because then that just becomes weakness. So a solution is something that eliminates the problem. Okay. Some parents homeschooling doesn't eliminate the problem in this education because most parents can't afford to homeschool because they have to work. Right. So I think homeschooling is a good alternative, but it is a bad it's not a solution. Okay. Black children have to be educated institutionally, okay, in schools that we build, run, own and operate. And they have to be educated with a brother that can forge a collective consciousness. Hmm. We have to forge a collective consciousness. Hmm. The purpose of education is social education. The number one reason children must be educated is so they can be taught, so that they can be taught how to function mm -hmm. within their community. They have to be taught how to function within their community. You cannot do that in isolation. When we brought parents education, their own child doesn't give up the shared collective consciousness that we need. Mm -hmm. Education is all about social education. You can't do that house to home. You have to do it in mass. Wow. It's like building a military and every child in the military is going to a basically military regiment. Mm -hmm. Where is collective consciousness? Where is the brotherhood? Where is the sisterhood? And that's forging a sense of community through isolated education. And that's what homeschooling is, is isolated education. Right. But again, it's just a temporary remedy. I'm not against it, I support it. But it's one of the seven essential committees of every national independent black family with this chapter. Now, the board, I would say, that the kind of things that they need to consider when they're talking about homeschool. Okay. Number one, you cannot just homeschool just because you don't like the public school system. That's true. You have to homeschool because you wouldn't want to do it. I keep stress that enough. Mm -hmm. It cannot be a reaction to the problem. It must be a call to based on what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have the time, if you don't have the energy, if you don't have the commitment, if you don't have the resources, then you're going to have terrible time. Mm -hmm. You must a personal inventory before you decide to homeschool your children. If you burned out already, if you already burned out as a mother, you work at two jobs, why are you going homeschool? You ain't got the time here. And so sometimes what I tell parents that they should do is have a home only the only young people that being laid off inside that's a racism. And so a lot of them are operating their own homeschool network. Okay. They're operating their own homeschool network. So guess what? Find you a homeschooling teacher. Find you a homeschooling teacher. And with that homeschooling teacher, you can change the Number two, they have to make sure you have a system of assessment. One of the biggest weaknesses of homeschooling parents is they don't have a system of assessment. Who do you want coming in to supervise you, coach you, and abide with your kids to make sure you are teaching them well? Mm -hmm. Most homeschools don't have that. They assume that they're going to get that. You can't assume nothing. You gotta get somebody come out somebody from the outside. Give them some eyeballs with their head. You're going through a reading with your math test. Mm -hmm. Somehow two two one one is a mouse. So what are you doing with your math book? Let's look at your math book and take that test. Then I have a coach. Mm -hmm. I teach homeschool coaching. I also do homeschool assessment. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm somebody who will coach the kids and let you know this is where they are and this is what you need to do. I do homeschool assessment. And if someone wants to teach me to do that, they can do that. I do do homeschool assessment. Okay, so that's that. You okay. gotta have that set. You have a own personal inventory. Okay. You know, to make sure you have the set. The last thing is that you have to make sure you have an assessment system. Number three, make sure you have discipline. Mm. Make sure you have discipline. Mm -hmm. In other words, you know, most people don't have a schedule. What do I mean by that? If you're going to home school your child Monday through Thursday from 8 o'clock to 1 o'clock. Right. Because I believe the child will be effective in homeschool in 20 hours a week. Okay. I just, I don't think you need to do anything more than 20. But if you do it well, you can do 20 hours. They don't need 35 like they did in the public school. The extra 15 is nothing but time wasted anyway. Recess and all class and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So 20 hours is good. But you got to be consistent. You can't talk about our homeschool from this day on. And then from now to six months, you on the phone with your mother. And then the next. In another 30 minutes, you stay home alone. Mm -hmm. In another 30 minutes, you're pushing your business. In the next 30 minutes, you're paying your own bills. And then you got nervous because you got to say, You're not there. You need to make sense. Mm -hmm. You are lying to yourself just because they get four or five hours of sleep. You can run your room for 25 minutes and sleep. But you're still going out and interrupting. Here's what I'm saying. If you're going to homeschool, if you're going to homeschool, 
will turn off the phone. You will turn off the computer. This should be safe if you are in that space with your child. Nothing else matters, so it's not about Your interest matters unless it is a church or a library. Nothing else matters. If you're not ready to do that, you're not ready to host you got to have a space in the house dedicated to home school. you got to have a space in the house dedicated to home school. A lot of parents don't talk because they want to treat it. you got to approach it in a professional way. Okay. you got to approach it in a professional way or it will break down and it won't come back to the middle house. Your whole house is not a school. Let the whole house be a school. If it's going to be an attic, if it's going to be a spare bedroom, if it's going to be a station, nothing will happen in that space at the home school. Right. Literally, from TV, from video games, this is something about home school. sure that you may not be the only person in this whole country who wants to open their own school but people who want to open their own schools what are some things that they have to keep in mind and what are some things they have to really watch out for uh, that would depend on the type of school they're trying to open and how large okay you know that they want it to be okay but generally speaking they have to make sure that the school that they acquire is able to be adjusted to their school concept. So you need area and space and modalities to meet the type of curriculum mm -hmm. that you're going to implement. You want a school that's in a neighborhood where it can be marketed well. In other words, you don't want a school in a place that's competing with 20 or 30 other independent schools. So you want to make sure you're in a neighborhood where the school can be. Right. Uh, you also very strong uh, what do you call it? Uh, Homeschool uh, relationship, parent participation. Uh, you want to make sure that parents can participate in the education because a lot of parents do want you know to participate. So you make sure you do that. Also, uh, your funding. You want to make sure that you understand your business plan and make sure that you'll be able to sustain and even grow the school over time. Um, also, you want to do a good job of training the people. Who you're ultimately going to have working for you because the school is like a nation. Right. It's literally like a nation. Everything that a nation needs, school needs. It needs security for defense. It needs food. It needs logistics. It needs insurance. It needs propaganda. The school is like a nation. So you have to really train who you have coming to your school. That's going to be my toughest job. Mm -hmm. To be honest with you, the toughest part of my school once it's open is you're going to be getting the students 
It isn't going to be the curriculum. It's going to be nothing. It's going to be making sure I don't let the wrong people in. Because there's going to be a lot of opportunities and other folks who are going to want to try to get behind the wall of my school. And some of them are going to be more than destroying other black people. So for me, making sure I find the best people and to make sure I keep out potential disruptors my toughest job. The personnel is always personnel. It's the personnel, the human resources is the biggest issue with the any profession mm-hmm. as education is. Not the mental financial resources, not the material resources, human. It is the people that make a great school, as I said earlier. It ain't the school that teaches, it's the people that teach. Okay. For the for the energy that um that you demand going on, right? Uh, the energy that you use to try to get into the situation that we're dealing with our local black community that we're trying to establish, what are some things that keep you sane? Because uh, obviously, you're a school psychologist. Uh, whatever some of the things that you see on a daily basis, that has to affect you too. So what are some things that you have? So in all African cultural systems, ancestral relationships are very key. So I try to stay very close to my ancestors. I think that without that relationship, I don't know about the social media, to be honest with you, because I don't have a lot of people I can trust. I don't have a lot of friends. Okay. Uh, I don't know a lot of good people. Um, I would say you're one of the few good people I actually have in my life, and I know you haven't done a lot of work together, but you're one of those genuine folks. You know that I have in my life who I can reach out to if I ever needed some support. But there's few of those people. Most people who come to me come with agendas. They come to they come with agendas, male and female. It's a romantic agenda, or it's an agenda to get famous off of my name. It's an agenda to build this platform off of mine. Very few sincere people come to me. It's one of the toughest parts of my job finding the right people who are coming here for the right reason, which is why I would say the whole celebrity aspect of being Dr. Umar Johnson does come with a serious downside. Wow. It comes with a very serious downside because people tend to forget that you're not a celebrity, you're a revolutionary. And mm-hmm. because of that, you know, you're looking for people who want to make a difference. And there's a lot of sacrifice involved in this, and I don't think people understand it or not. So the ancestral veneration is key to me. Obviously, building my relationship with God, Supreme ruler of the universe, uh, without him, none of us would be here. That's all very important to me. Mm-hmm. And they get that much needed on and off. For example, this is tomorrow. Mm-hmm. This is the first day of my vacation in March. And it's not a true vacation because I still have to take care of the administrative stuff, visiting school and mm-hmm. the fundraiser and put together the college store. And doing interviews. <laughs> and doing and interviews for people like me. Done. Right. But I take regular breaks now. Right. To make sure my mind gets the type of rest that it needs so I don't suffer from a nervous breakdown. Right, 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 man. Dr. Umar, I can't thank you enough for the information that you shared tonight. Uh, I know we're coming down. You said we have uh, up until 9 o'clock, right? Uh, to, to around 9 o'clock. So uh, what I want to do is to make sure that I maximize this interview. Uh, you're a very busy person. And honestly, too, I respect rest as well. Uh, <laughs> so when it's, when it's time for you to uh, actually sit down and reboot and get your energy back up, I want to respect that as well. So. However, I do want to let you know um, about the information that you've shared so far, what that has actually done to me or done for me. Um, that whole conversation that we briefly had tonight about the gap between the youth and the elders in our community, that right there hit home, I would say. Because um, sometimes we have friction not only in our communities, but you know, some people's first community is their family, honestly. And some people's community doesn't even go past their family. So there's a lot of people who have elders in their family that they think they cannot go talk to, and some elders in the family that they think they can't even talk to the youth because some people will say, well, this new generation. Have you ever heard people talk about this new generation and some of the things? generation was birthed, you know, they, you know, uh, we keep trying to disassociate ourselves from the youth, and they are a direct and result of who we were, as they say, you just
judge a tree by the fruit that it bears. Mm. And so there is no separation between the youth and the adults. They are what happens when raising your children as a community is no longer your priority. This is what you get. That's deep. Um, we, on our radio show, this manhood mindset, we try to talk about self accountability, right? Um, we not only talk about our plight, but we also talk about our possibilities. Can you tell us about well, your opinion of the thin line between self responsibility and blame? Because I think a lot of people don't understand that. Because sometimes I'm pretty sure some of the things that you talked about about our uh, community or the community that we were trying to build, you said a lot of things that some people are going to be offended at. How dare he say we hate each other? How dare he say we don't trust each other? This, that, and the other, right? However, how are we going to take care of our problems if we don't take responsibility of our part in it? So for the people who get, I guess, offended at the truth behind the quote-unquote black community, what is your um, what are your suggestions on how they can get through that initial pain? Because honestly, some of the things that you were saying, I was like, ah, you know, some are those, are those some of the things that I actually do? Do I look at people and uh, distrust them? Do I look at people side eye, you know, in, in this whole system that we try to uh, survive or whatnot? So can you speak on how can we get over ourselves and look at ourselves in a reality uh, mentality? The greatest victory of slavery was that the master reproduced himself in us. Mm -hmm. That's the greatest victory of slavery. He made robots. Out of his place. And those robots in turn made their children into more robots. And so here's the thing. One of the reasons why the world does not feel bad or bad about what happens to black folks in America in particular is because we are the only African population on earth that totally has the ability has the ability to solve its own problems without government intervention. Mm. We can do it ourselves. We don't need the government to do nothing. Last year, 2016 spent $600 million on the South, $2 billion on the insurance, $4 billion on liquor and alcohol, mm -hmm. $9 billion on weed and perm. We purchased three times the big vendor of America, about one hour. Solution. Solution. There's only one solution, and everybody knows what it is. They don't accept it. 
And that solution is you have to do what? Take responsibility for your own future. Mm-hmm. Your own future. Mm-hmm. We have to build it. We have to do for ourselves mm-hmm. what the Chinese are doing for themselves. Mm-hmm. We have to do for ourselves what the Europeans need to do for themselves. And black folks don't want to hear that. Mm-hmm. We don't want to hear any solution that means we got to spend money, we got to spend time, we got to spend resources. We don't want that. We want something simple. We want to vote. We want to pray. Mm-hmm. We want to march. We do not have to commit. The black folks mm-hmm. don't have any equity in each other. We don't have any equity in each other. So any solution that requires me to spend money on helping black folks, I'm not interested in it. And that's why we stay stuck where we are. Mm-hmm. Because we're not going to invest in ourselves. So we're like a people walking in court. I know you mentioned uh, before, uh, I actually seen you at a previous event in Atlanta, and I remember one of the things that you talked about was the difference between being conscious and being committed. Being conscious and being committed. And you said, you reiterated over and over again, I need committed people. Can you elaborate on that? Because I know you just hinted on it a little bit. Can you can you really drive that home? Okay. You know, consciousness is being well read, well read. Consciousness is knowing the facts. Consciousness is knowing the data. Consciousness is being able to uh, restate the historical record. Mm-hmm. But consciousness is only cerebral. It's intellectual. You can be very conscious of the black reality, but have no commitment to change it. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of black scholars in the country. They are masters of the history. Mm-hmm. They can regurgitate the historical record. They can run it down. Mm. But when it comes to being a part of this solution, don't look for them. Mm. And so we assume that consciousness is everything. It's not. Consciousness is only one of the five essential psychological variables that are needed to be a part of the black revolution. The other four. In addition to consciousness, you've got to have the courage. And that's more important than the consciousness to me. Yeah. Because a man who don't know what's willing to fight, it's going to be more useless than I know. The man who knows that ain't willing to fight. Courage is more important than consciousness. Mm. Commitment is more important than consciousness. Consistency is more important than consciousness. Mm. Creativity is more important than consciousness. Those are the five. Consciousness, commitment, consistency, creativity, and courage. You need all five. And you should judge all black leaders and organizers by those five. By those five. You've got to have all five. It cannot be one or two or three. You need all five. One this is okay. Our 19th century is the greatest period of black renaissance we've had since our fall from the great community of Africa. Okay. 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 Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. Don't need nothing by itself. You know how many sellouts know where they come from? You know how many sellouts can give you the whole African history? You know how many sellouts can run down the history of any black organization? Consciousness is nothing without the courage and the commitment. We gotta make sure our children have all five. Doc, that was uh that was it, man. <laughs> that that was it. Uh I think um what you shared tonight really has um, helped me as a person. Um, and I try to, you know, we, we do on the radio show, we try to make sure we don't speak for other people. But I can speak for myself. Uh, this was some profound information that you have shared with us. And uh, I'm going to work on myself to see how committed I really am. Um, there's one thing about getting more information and more information, but when it's time to put up or shut up, do we have the actual courage to actually do it? Um, so I want to just... First of all, just thank you for um, carving out a, a piece of your schedule just to, you know, bless our show with your presence, man. I really, really appreciate that. 
Uh, a lot of people may see you all over the internet, all over TV, and, and really don't understand who you are and get a chance to talk to you directly. But I want to just tell you how much I really appreciate you just sacrificing your time just to talk to the audience who support manhood mindset at our chapter of Omega Sci Fi down here in Georgia Southern. So I really want to appreciate that. I really do, man. So, uh, and, and a lot of people don't know that you actually came down to Georgia Southern a couple of years ago in 2014 and, uh, and spoke to our students. And I remember that, in, that uh, entire um, uh, experience and the students who had a chance to get to know you and get to talk to you and shake your hand and uh, have a full-fledged conversation with you, um, their lives were forever changed. And for a lot of people that don't know, is that when you see Dr. Umar in person, um, a lot of people didn't know that day is when I came and asked you, I said, hey, I know you're quite busy, but we got some students that, you know, you kind of changed their life earlier today and they want to talk to you. And Dr. Umar Johnson stayed and talked to the students down here until 10, what, 1045 that night? It was, yeah, it was quite late. So um, just that type of uh, commitment, because uh, you, you, are, you are a very well-educated brother. However, you have time for people. And I think a lot of people don't understand how valuable that may be for us to, to, to appreciate, I would say. So I want to just tell you as an, uh, one man to another, I really appreciate your commitment, your time, your effort, and your consistency. Um, we, see a lot of, we see a lot of times when we come up and we try to stand against things that may be detrimental. And sometimes we get complacent or we get rewarded to shut up. You know what I mean? So I, I really want to uh, just tell you thank you um, on behalf of me um, and everybody on the show. Uh, thank you for what you're doing. Uh, um, to you. Uh, keep your strength up. Keep your health up. You know, the people are going to need you, man. And, and um, that's, that's pretty much it, man. So we're going to ask you to close out the show with your contact information again and your final thought for tonight. Contact information, DrUmarJohnson.com. Dr. Umar Johnson at Yahoo.com. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dr. Umar Johnson. Again, Twitter and Instagram at Dr. Umar Johnson. If you're on Facebook, you can follow me at Dr. Umar E. Fatute. I use my Yoruba last name on Facebook. E. Fatute is spelled I S A T U N D E. Dr. Umar E. Fatute on Facebook. Is myself and brother Charlemagne from the Breakfast Club interview. Ah, also, yes. a Tuesday morning call uh, every Tuesday. Uh, Black Power and Conference is sort of coming up. Mm -hmm. We're also going back to Africa this year, two week Africa tour. I should have that information in the next couple weeks as well. That will be the last week of July, mm -hmm. first week in August. And again, anybody wants to start a study group for the National Independent mm -hmm. Black Parent Association, uh, please reach out to me. Individuals who are interested in having me come to speak, they can email my assistant, Ms. Williams, at drumarspeaks at yahoo.com. That's D R U M A R speak with an S at yahoo.com. That goes straight to her. Okay. I'll personally email with Dr. Umar Johnson at yahoo.com, but I'll be taking off the month of March, so I'll be available for some limited uh, telephone conversations and that whole type of thing there. So, that's phone number 8444 D R U N A R 8444 D R U N A R. And I quote with a quote from the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey, the greatest black leader of the 20th century, who said, Without confidence in yourself, you are twice defeated in the race of life. But with confidence, you have one even before you have begun. Ladies and gentlemen, you have tuned in tonight for 919 The Buzz Manhood Mindset. The Zeta Delta Delta Chapter of Omega Sci Fi Return Incorporated with our brother Your My Mind campaign and our initiative. We'd like to personally thank Dr. Umar Johnson for blessing our, our show tonight. Hopefully, you got some things out of it. I know definitely I did. However, if you listen to the show tonight, we will be recording it and put it up on Facebook and YouTube and SoundCloud and things of that nature. We highly suggest when you listen to the show, that you write down notes and not only when you write down notes and be conscious of the problem be committed to solving it dr umar johnson we really appreciate it man we want to uh just wish you many blessings and, and god speak to you brother all right will do thank you ladies and gentlemen for 
tuning in to Manhood Mindset 919 The Buzz. We're located in WVGS 91.9. Big deal. You got anything to tell to the people? No, no, no. Yeah, man. So thank y'all so much for people who've been uh, tuning in to uh, to Facebook Live. Uh-oh. There we go. Uh, yeah, he dealt. Uh, <laughs> pretty much. So uh, thank you for everybody who chimed in on Facebook Live. Thank you for everybody who chimed in uh, in the local uh, community on 91.9. Hopefully we got something out of it. It was not necessarily for everyone to agree with what was going on, but it at least gets some information that you can chew on. If you don't agree with it, that's good. You don't have to agree with it. Uh, all the views and expressions were of Dr. Umar Johnson and of the host of the show and not reflective of the radio show itself. So I want to make sure everybody understood that. We're not telling anybody what to think. We just interviewed our guest to see how he actually thought. All right, and so we gave you options. Um, different comments, suggestions, or whatnot, and feel free. One of the biggest things that you can do is educate yourself. So if you're wondering how to solve the problem, you might want to get to the root, and miseducation is one of the biggest roots of our issues. So make sure that you get the reading, be committed, be courageous, be conscious, but also, too, we've been through a lot as a people. Go get yourself some counseling, all right? Go and talk to somebody, get you some, get you some help, there's nothing wrong with helping yourself, especially if you're setting yourself up for success and how to um, put yourself in a position where you can actually contribute to rebuilding or building in the first place the black community. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much for tuning in. We'll be back next week. Peace out. It's from Georgia. We are WVGS 919 The Buzz. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I know. So, who's starting it? Starting it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's it. Huh? That's amazing. Go, Chris. Go. Any reason why you kept cutting out all my speech? Well, some people could hear me asking questions. Is that correct right here? When I was asking them questions, people needed to hear me here, right? Right. Oh, it's live. But then I, as far as live, but then I realized that with this on, because mm-hmm. I started watching the signal and how I was recording here, it was picking up you. It was picking up me. It was. It was picking up you. Good, good, good. So that's why I kind of stopped listening, because I realized that when you were talking, the needles weren't moving. They were. So it's something through here that's hooked up to the phone Okay. that picks you up anyway. Okay. I that's might be just real close to it. I'm no telling you. So, um, but the good thing about it is, I wasn't, when you, when you had left, I forgot to do this, but it was more than likely it was still picking me up, right? Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank y'all so much for tuning in. This will be recorded. Go back to the, um, to the actual site. I'll be sharing it, tag some people, share with people you think will benefit, man. Appreciate it.